Our community developers have several demos to share with you today. We'll start with JJ from our DevRel team, um, and he has a demo about creating um, a database of historical crypto. Thanks, Margaret. So I've got uh, two demos today, and the first of which Margaret just mentioned is going to be about creating your own historical crypto database in less than 50 lines of code and less than uh, 30 seconds. Um, so I uh, was perusing around some available Python modules today uh, for pulling crypto data, and I stumbled across one called Crypto CMD, which has uh, something called CMC Scraper, which is a class which allows you to pull historical crypto data from coin market cap. And uh, after trying this um, this module out for a bit, I was really impressed. Um, so this script I have at the bottom of the screen here um, will uh, pull data for a set of uh, coins. I have a list of, I think it's 24 coins here. Um, some of these coins actually don't exist on the site and uh, it will just ignore them if that's the case. And so when I run this script, um, it creates uh, one large table that contains all of the historical crypto data for all of the coins that there, that, uh, for which data exists in this list. And it will then um, take uh, every single coin and write out the um, historical crypto data. Um, I didn't show it. I probably should have showed it before I ran the script, but I don't have any Parquet files um, for historical crypto data in my data directory in my Deephaven installation. Um, and after this, I will do, I will show uh, what is in my data directory. There will be, I think it's 24 different, or maybe 22. I think two of the, um, I think two of the coins don't actually exist, uh, MZC and Nano. Um, but anyway, I've got this crypto history table. It creates this long table that's got uh, 48,000 rows, um, and it's got all of the coins that are in this list in it. And so if I import the OS module, I can then um, print what is in my data directory, and we can see that I have all of these uh, parquet files, um, dash history, you know, doge history, and so on and so forth. And so uh, if I wanted to add, uh, remove or update any of these coins, I absolutely could. And I could just run the script over again and increase the amount of data that I have uh, at my fingertips for analysis. So I thought that the, the crypto CFD and uh, coin market cap uh, are pretty cool. Um, do we wanna just go straight into the second demo? Um, and for my second demo today, I have, um, uh, using the Open Dota API in Deephaven. So I have uh, a couple of scripts here that I'll run. Um, I have been kind of working uh, when the time permits on using the Open Dota API, which for anybody who's not aware, um, Dota 2 is one of the most popular video games uh, out nowadays. It is also the most lucrative video game for professional video game players or uh, professional e-athletes as they, as they are called. Um, and it is a 5v5 MOBA that um, has quite an active community. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of people playing basically at any given time. And so one of the cool thing is, uh, one of the cool things about uh, Dota 2 is that there is an open API that anyone can go in and use. Um, if you want to just use it without worrying about getting an API key and all that stuff, you are allowed up to 60 requests to the API a minute. Um, but if you want to obtain an API key to, to do more, um, as you get the first uh, 50,000 API calls per month are free, and then if anything after that is one penny for every 100 API calls after that. So I've been playing around with the free version, and um, but with the you know with eyeing um, applications that are scalable to use a lot more API calls than uh, than than that 50,000 maximum for the free the free tier. So I have uh, the first script and I envision this as something in the Deephaven dash examples repository where um, the user doesn't actually have to run this script. It will just run on its startup. Um, but the first thing I'll show is um, I will be pulling from uh, the Open Dota's live interface, which showcases the uh, top 100 live matches that are going on uh, right now, actually. So you can see 
Uh, there's this large table with match ID, start time, uh, end time. If the match is currently active, this end time is just going to be the current time. Um, so I can sort by matches. Apple Mouse thinks I'm right clicking. There we go. I can sort by matches that are actually active. I can also sort by the average MMR. The MMR is basically the player skill uh, of everybody involved. Okay, my mouse really doesn't want to cooperate right now. But anyway, um, I've got uh, this table. I've got it updating once every minute. Um, so this table uh, will, or rather, this table will grow. Uh, and this just gets the last by every given match ID um, in the table. And so I've got another one, uh, another script here called uh, get match data, which will pull a lot more data for an individual match. Um, I'll run this script and it defines a function that will return a few tables um, regarding the heroes that are in the game, um, team fights or basically combat that's happening, as well as um, the chat in the game. Uh, I have yet to really prune out some of these tables. Um, so this is not what they will look like in, um, in, in the final version, um, but still, I think it's pretty cool. So that, that's it for me. All right. Well, thank you, JJ. We're going to pass things off to Ryan. Um, he's got a demo of partitioned tables as a first class aggregation. Hi. Hi, everybody. I uh, please ignore the lack of polish. I hardly ever do demos. And so I have less practice than some of my colleagues here. But uh, on the bright side, I'm excited about what I'm going to show you today. Uh, so let's see if we're looking at the right screen. Oh, great. OK, so this is uh, a, uh, a console. Uh, running locally, uh, which is kind of fun. Let me just sort of start from the beginning here. Uh, I've, I've got some data that uh, our colleague Devin has been publishing from crypto exchanges. Uh, in this case, it's um, a ring of 10 million or up to 10 million rows of trades of, of various different products on various different exchanges. So you can see right now, I only have 500,000 rows. We could get a little bit started, started a little bit late, but um, regardless has plenty to show some some range here um so start with this this is just a table this is a barrage table we, we have a, a complete replica of the data here locally uh here let me go and uh reverse the table so you can see that it's actually ticking um you know there, there are trades coming in this thing is updating live um now the new op the, the main thing i want to show you guys to begin with is that we have this this we've had this existing operation from something called partition by uh or a new enterprise size called uh by external and it used to return what was called a table map. And a table map is basically, it's trying to give you abstraction of a map from keys to tables, right? So the keys might be the actual values for the columns that you, that you uh, partition by, or they might be a compound of those columns, right? But we decided we might rather actually be able to um, show you the, the keys as a table because firstly it avoids the whole problem of dealing with different kinds of key types for different um, numbers of keys but secondly it lets you actually interact with those All right so let's just go ahead and, and give you a quick view here it's a little it's gonna be a little boring in this case i believe but uh, let's do so we have that pressure table pt it's not showing because it's not designed to show on the GUI, but uh, we want to do uh, no just the underlying table there you go so here, that is a table showing you the keys of the aggregation. And look, we have a constituent column that is full of query tables. And those are actual ticking tables in Deep Haven uh, that we can interact with. Um, now, one way we can inter interact with them is kind of via this uh, proxy idea, right? So we will just go ahead and get it, make ourselves a proxy. And so now we have a proxy to the partition table um, that lets us apply table operations uh, with a single operation to all of the tables making up that partition table. All right, so, uh, you know, here, quick, you know, let's, let's get a quick operation. Let's say we want to do an update. We'd like to calculate the dollar volume for each of these trades by multiplying the price times the size. So we're going to go ahead and just apply that updated proxy and get a new proxy. Uh, it takes a couple seconds because you know, not zero data. And maybe, you know, maybe you guys would like to actually see something. So maybe we'll just uh, merge that proxy, right? So, uh, or is she going to be, hold on, uh, merged dollar. Get the target partition table and we'll merge it. Okay. Now you have the, the dollar volume for each of the trades that we've seen. 
And again, because we're, we're working on the original table, not the reverse, you guys are looking at, at the reverse if you want to see the actual results here, right? So now you have freeze trade as it's coming in, the dollar volume. Now, it, you know, it's interesting, we're not seeing a tick, but I, I think that's also because we're, because we have a view we're looking at, right? So um, this is because it's a merge, we're actually looking at, at sort of each table that's, that makes up the, um, the partition table is sort of striped in, in this case, right? Um, I think if you do like a group, a group by followed by ungroup, it, it's basically an equivalent kind of result, except with proper ticking rather than massive tick, tick amplification. Uh, now, let's go on to sort of so, so now just just to mention like that that proxy, all it's really doing is it's ex exploiting an operation that lives on a person table called transform. Transform basically is a fancy wrapper around update to say take a table, apply something that that changes the table into another table, and return a new table, giving you a new partition table as a result. Right, so it's just unwrapping the table, applying an update to it, and rewrapping the table, okay? Uh, which is a nice bit of syntactic sugar, but you can do the same thing with update uh, on the underlying table of the partition table, which is, um, we, we looked at the underlying table before, that's what this guy was here, right? Uh, now let's do something a little bit more fun. Um, sorry about my history being a mess. Uh, I don't know what didn't load properly right now. Um, let me just go back to where I wanted to be. Here, let's do an aggregation. Now, this will be kind of fun. So this is an aggregation on that original trades table. Okay, uh, you'll notice that we're doing an act partition with a name called with a table called name called constituent. We're also doing uh, an act sum of that is a sum of of size to make the volume. Okay, and we're going to do this by exchange instrument. So I run that. Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I, I got the wrong thing out of my history. Uh, I can't use a list. I want to use it. Here we go. Uh, so here we now have an actual aggregation. Uh, but as you see here, now we have the, the key column, the exchange and the instrument. Uh, we have our constituent column, the actual tables that are bucketed from the source table by exchange instrument. But we also notably have another aggregation as well here, which is this volume column. That's the result of a sum by. Uh, and so we've, we've got a complex aggregation. And, the cool thing here is we can actually interact with that volume column in addition to the key columns, right? So we could take that, I know, I guess I'm sorry for my history problems here. Um, we can go and take that result. Uh, maybe we want to sort the result of this aggregation, right? By volume and then take the last instrument or, so the, the is this the one I really wanna do? Well, I guess I'll just do it. We'll find the um, biggest exchange for each instrument, right? So what we've done here is for each exchange, for, for each instrument, what exchange did the most volume? Let's see all the trades for that exchange, right? Uh, and, and I guess you might want to actually see this as something a little more interesting. So let's get it merged so you can actually look at the results. All right, so here we're going to wrap it in a partition table. Nope, what did I do wrong? Sorry, wrong column name. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And now we can actually look at the data here. So now what you've got is the, for the, 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 the exchange that did the most volume for a given um, instrument, all the trades on that exchange for that instrument, right? Which is, I mean, I'm not sure that's a particularly meaningful um, aggregation or result. I just wanted to kind of show that, that you can do that kind of thing. You can react to, in, in dynamically, to, to changes in aggregations other than the partition in order to control how you react to the, um, how, how you look at the partitions, right? So this was just a filter, it's a little boring. We could also, um, for example, uh, so, so, um, go and sort that aggregation. So we have that, that table biggest, right? Which is the, again, it was the biggest exchange for each instrument, right? So let's go and then um, 
we're going to sort him back to this sorted. I don't know, we want to, what do we want to sort on? We want to sort on um, volume? Why not? And so now we have the the the, the, the instruments that are done the smallest or the exchange they've done the most on to the instruments that are done the most or the exchange they've done the most on, right? Um, so presumably we can expect a little more excitement going on. It looks like SHIB slash USD is doing the most right now. But um, let's go ahead and kind of rerun our, our merge operation. Now we're at this time we want to be on biggest sorted, right? And we can look at a similar merge. Now we're sorted because our input is sorted, right? And so we've sorted those tables without having to sort the individual rows, right? So we're sorting the partitions rather than sorting the rows, uh, which is, is, is makes quite a difference from a performance standpoint, right? So now we knew we knew that the SHIB ticket was doing the most. So here, we, here we actually see it doing work, right? Um, so uh, the, the, the key thing here is we, we've now, with a new interface, we have unlocked both you know, parallel transformation in, in a way that was already there for table maps, but is, is has been improved and has an improved framework uh, and, and improved dependency tracking here in partition tables. We've made tables within tables a reality of a concept that we can actually work with and express and, and interact with. We've elevated partition to a, a first class aggregation that can be commingled with other aggregations and lets you work with, with both kinds of aggregations at the same time. And uh, one other thing that's worth mentioning here is that the, 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 this aggregation, this merge, sorry, this merge of the aggregation is sensitive to the input order of your partitions, right? So it, it, unlike the, the prior functionality that existed, because we, we actually are, are noticing as your, your input tables are shifted or moving around because they are implicitly ordering. And so if you were to remove a table, it's going to be removed to the right spot. If you were to re-add it somewhere else, it's going to be re-added to the right spot. And its rows in the merge will also be re-added re in the right spot. Uh, so this becomes a real surrogate for group on group in a way that the previous partition by merge was not. Um, so that that's the, the those are the main concepts I wanted to illustrate for you today. Uh, sorry about the the history hiccups there, but uh, anybody have any? Or I guess we don't do questions demo. So there, um, I'm going to unshare and move on to the next demo. Over. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, last but not least, we have Devin uh, who will. Uh, show two demos, but he'll start with custom parsers for Kafka streams. Great. Um, I want to make sure everybody can see my screen here. Um, looking good? Yes. Great. Um, I just want to direct people to our documentation to start with. Um, we've got some good documentation around uh, Kafka streams for JSON, um, the JSON format and for the Avro format right here. Um, so you might have seen these before. You declare an Avro spec or you declare a JSON spec uh, and then give the spec. Um, if we search, we'll also see a couple places listed for simple spec. Um, and typically these are just simple values, um, but I'm going to go ahead and show you where you can use simple spec to uh, implement your own parser for something that is actually more complex. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, oops, let me go ahead and show you. So here's the logic I'm going to use to connect to my Kafka stream. Um, the important thing we're going to do here is we're going to give it a value deserializer um, of this type right here, of a byte array deserializer. Uh, and then we give it a simple spec with the column name that we want. In this case, um, I'm calling it bytes. We could call it raw, we could call it anything we wanted, um, but it's going to be a byte array on the output. Uh, and then let's say um, that I wanted to parse this these bytes, because uh, I knew what they were, into my object, into a foo int in a bar string. Uh, I could declare this class here, or I could have a library um, that was protobufs or some other um, object format. Um, I could declare uh, my parsing function. Um, so I'm cheating here. I'm not actually really parsing uh, the data, but let's just pretend I am. Really what I'm doing here is I'm taking the length and then I'm uh, doing a SHA-256 uh, hex digest of it and then creating the object, but this could be any logic you wanted to actually parse those bytes. Um, so what we do is we get our um, 
raw table first, so I'll run all of this uh, so you can see what the table looks like. Uh, so this is what the table looks like when you just give it a simple spec with uh, this bytes deserializer. You can see we've got these bytes that are coming in. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pass that to the my parser, and it's going to return uh, my object. Um, we're doing this cast right here um, because it is coming back into, into Java, and we need Java to know that it's actually a Python object and we can get it by attribute. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and extract um, the actual columns that we want out of here, foo and bar. Uh, so if we just run these first two um, lines right here, uh, you'll see that we're going to parse the object out. And so now we've got a, uh, a column with this object in it. Um, but if we actually wanted to extract that further into columns, like I just showed here, we just do a view and pull the attributes out. Um, and so there you go. So now we've got our table. We've had custom bytes coming in. We can do any sort of parsing we want to it and then splay, out, splay it out into its individual columns. Um, so that was my first demo. Uh, my next demo is, is a little bit less exciting, but I think um, there's some really good long-term value in it, and that is access controls. And that is uh, basically allowing somebody to consume the data, but not allowing them to execute any code themselves. Um, so I've got this other demo that I've um, started up here, acl-demo.stream.dpaven.io. Um, I don't have any exciting data at this URL, but it should be publicly accessible. Um, I've just got some ticking timetables here. Um, but one of the important things is I'm disallowing um, at a low level code execution. Uh, so if I try to execute some code here, um, nothing should happen. Um, the uh, web UI doesn't necessarily know how to respond to some of the error conditions that it's getting, so that's maybe why you're seeing it run here for a little bit. Um, and then uh, something you might be used to doing is sorting. I've disallowed sorting as well. So if you try to sort here, uh, it's not going to get happy. Um, these are some things that we need to improve in the UI so it knows when you're actually disallowed to do stuff. Um, but this is a way to um, ensure that if you are putting out public data in there that we can lock down the API and we've got a way to access it um, without allowing code execution um, or potentially expensive operations. Uh, so again, on this server, uh, I've turned off all forms of execution and you can't sort. All you can do is you can get viewports or you can grab all the data. So hopefully we'll be having some more documentation uh, around uh, both these concepts uh, shortly. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and thanks uh, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye.